Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm doing another Kahoot, but I'm going to be covering psychiatric nursing. It's going to be a wide variety of topics. Now, something to keep in mind, on my Kahoots, I don't ask nursing questions the way you would get them on a test or exam. I'm asking you more concepts, and these are concepts you need to know in order to answer your nursing questions that you get on tests or exams. If you're looking more for the nursing question types, you got to watch my videos, the ones that I release on Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you're more interested in learning via my lectures, those I do sporadically, the same as I do the cahoots. So I try to um, provide provide information to you guys in different ways so you can understand the material, whether it's the concepts that you need to understand or it's the questions, the actual nursing questions you need to understand how to break them down and answer. So I just kind of wanted to clarify that for you. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video, subscribing to this channel if you haven't done so already, and go ahead and click on that red notification bell so you'll be notified every single time a new video is released. Don't forget, I'm now offering next generation NCLEX reviews and also one-on-one -on -one tutoring and consultation uh, sessions. You can reserve your spot right now by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com and reserving your spot. Also, don't forget on my website, again, nexusnursinginstitute.com, you can go ahead and get yourself one or many audio lessons. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. When you document that your schizophrenic patient has a flat affect, this means that the patient's exhibiting what? Let me move this down for you. Is it a minimal emotional response, an immobile facial expression or blank look, an emotional response that's opposite with the tone of the situation, or inappropriate laughing, smiling, or grimacing? What does it mean when your patient has a flat affect? If you weren't able to make it in the live, I stopped at 100 people. If you weren't able to make it um, into the Kahoot, excuse me, you can still answer on the live. The correct answer is immobile facial expression or blank look. When the patient has a flat affect, you can't tell if they're happy or sad or angry or frustrated. It's as if they just have a mask over their face and you cannot tell the emotions that they feel, okay? Your psych patient says to you, stop following me. I know you work for the FBI and I'm on to you. Which is being exhibited? Is this a delusion, a hallucination, circumstantiality, or loose association? The correct answer is delusion. So when a patient has a false belief, that's what's known as a delusion. They believe in something that is completely not true. Which situation would be considered a tertiary prevention intervention related to family violence? Would it be identifying families at risk, early case finding and decisive intervention for an abused child, changing societal views towards abuse of women or helping an abused woman overcome physical effects of abuse, which is considered a tertiary prevention intervention. Oh, wonderful. Yep. Helping an abused woman overcome physical effects of abuse. You guys absolutely have to know the difference between primary secondary and tertiary. So with primary prevention, it has not happened. We don't want it to happen. So we do lots of teaching. We do lots of education, right? That is primary. Secondary, we suspect maybe it happened. So we might do some tests to see if it happened. We might want to see how far it's gone. That's secondary. Tertiary, it's already happened. 
We just want to prevent it from getting worse. So in this case, we're talking about tertiary. Patient's already been abused. We just want to um, help the patient get better, but it's already happened. So that's going to be tertiary. You guys absolutely are expected to know the difference between the three. Now for testing purposes, usually the examples that you're going to get for primary, it's either going to be like an education, community education or vaccinations. For secondary, it's usually going to be something like a biopsy or a mammogram or a colonoscopy. And then for tertiary, it's usually going to be something rehab, -like, such as physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. Your patient's been taking haloperidol, Haldol for six weeks now. Which would you document as a therapeutic response? Would it be a tense facial expression, an inability to concentrate, an interest in what's happening in the environment, or an increase in muscle strength? An interest in what's happening in the environment. So guys, uh, Haldol, this is an antipsychotic medications, medication. And so when a patient is psychotic, literally psychosis, that means to be out of touch with reality. So psych meds, not only Haldol, but psych meds across the board, they're going to take a couple weeks to take effect, right? Haldol takes about four to six weeks. So after about six weeks, and you want to see if this medication is really start is really working. One of the things you're going to assess for: Are they taking an interest in their environment, in their here and now? Because if they're taking an interest in their here and now, in their environment, what does that tell you? Most likely, they're what in touch with reality. So that antipsychotic medication's working. Your homeless patient says to you. I'm the American president and I have more money than Oprah Winfrey. Your patient is having a visual illusion, an auditory hallucination, a grandiose delusion, or a loose association. You guys are doing great on the live. Good job. What do you guys see on Kahoot? Okay, it's a grandiose delusion. Remember, a delusion is having a false thought. When you put that adjective, you put that sub, sub uh, um, uh, I'm losing my thought. What's the word? I'm descriptive. When you put that descriptive word in front of delusion, grandiose, what does that mean? Someone who thinks of themselves higher than they really are right? Someone with grandiose delusions, they think that they're God or that they're Jesus or, you know, that they're emperor of the world. So this person has a grandiose, they think they're way higher than they really are, delusion, false thought. Now look at the other choices. You have a visual illusion that is actually seeing something that is not there. Auditory hallucination. You're hearing voices that do not exist and loose association. That's when a person's talking and their sentences aren't making sense. Like they have all of these, um, 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 clusters of thoughts, but when you put it together, it makes sense. So the person says, you know, I love French fries. I hate going to Paris. My dog ate the cat. And so all of these sentences, when you put it together, it absolutely makes no sense. Your patient gets angry with you and punches the wall. What defense mechanism is your patient displaying? Denial, regression, displacement, or reaction formation? Displacement. That anger is displaced. They're upset with you, the nurse, right? But 
because um, the position that you hold or for whatever reason, you are threatening to them. So they don't want to display that anger to you. So they're going to display that anger on something much less threatening, such as the wall, because guess what? The wall can't punch back. Put your hands on me if you want to, right? So that's what displacement is. When your anger is really towards one subject, but you find that subject to be threatening. And so you take your anger out on something much less threatening. That is displacement. Now, denial. Denial, that is a defense mechanism where you're refusing the reality of a situation because your mind and your heart just can't accept it, right? Regression, that is going back to a time where you felt safe. So you're going back in time. So children who, when there's a new sibling in the house and all of a sudden they start wetting the bed or they start crawling on the ground, they're regressing, their behavior is regressing. Reaction formation, that is behaving the opposite of how you really feel. So you can't stand your boss. You come home every day and you tell your husband or wife how much you hate your boss. But every time you go to work, you're giving your boss a gift. You don't really mean it because you, you can't stand them. So reaction formation is behaving the opposite of how you feel. Which behavior is seen in the patient with social phobia? Would it be fear of leaving the house, shortness of breath and dyspnea when riding an elevator, persistent hand washing? I'm sorry, I spelled persistent wrong, but that's what it says. Or fear of embarrassing self in front of others. Which would you choose for social phobia? Okay, let's talk about this because both on Kahoot and the live, most of you guys chose fear of leaving the house. But no, look at look at this description. What does it say? Social, to be around people. What they're really scared of is being around people. They're scared of doing something stupid or people laughing at them. That's what they're afraid of. The phobia, phobia is what? Social being around people, not leaving the house. What if they live in the middle of the woods? They wouldn't be scared to leave the house. There wouldn't be anybody outside. What they're afraid of is being in social settings. That's the problem. Which personality type is attention seeking? These people are often known as drama kings or drama queens. Would it be borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, or avoidant personality disorder? Okay, so let's talk about this. The correct answer is histrionic. Most of you guys chose narcissistic. And even on the live, most of you chose narcissistic. Yes, people who are narcissistic, they tend to also be drama queens or kings. That tends to be an aspect of their personality type. But if you had to choose just one of these choices based on just the attention-seeking and drama king queen, it would be histrionic. The histrionic person is the one who, as soon as they walk in the room, all eyes have to be on them at all times. You see people who are narcissistic, lots of narcissistic people are low-key narcissistic. And that's why when someone else accuses them of being a narcissistic, nobody ever believes them because they're really good at manipulating people, right? So not all narcissistic people um, are drama queens and kings and love all eyes on them. Borderline. Let's talk about borderline for a second. Borderline personality disorder. This person, um, they like getting their way. They're manipulative. They um, hold on to these relationships like they're overboard. Hold on to the relationship. They're always worried that the person's going to leave them. And then what happens is they'll try to get attention as soon as the, their partner tries to leave them. They'll fake try to commit suicide. They'll take a whole bunch of pills, right? And then call the person and say, hey, I just took a whole bunch of pills because you're about to leave me. They um, like to cause splitting behaviors. You guys learn about splitting in um, psych where, you know, you're all good. You're such a wonderful person until you do something they 
they don't like. All of a sudden, you're the worst person in the world, right? They don't know how to uh, handle stress. The minute that they're stressed, they act out either by harming themselves, by cutting themselves, by pretending like they're going to kill themselves. Very often, pe pe people with borderline personality disorder, they kill themselves accidentally because they have these, it's called suicidal gestures. And so they'll time it to hang themselves at the change of shift. So when the nurse comes in, the nurse will see that they're hanging, the nurse will save them. And then, you know, they get a lot of attention that way. But what if something happened to the nurse, the nurse was getting report, they took too long and then they accidentally harmed themselves. A lot of them accidentally killed themselves that way. But let's get back to the histrionic. Histrionic, that the being the drama king and queen that is all encompassing for that personality disorder. Anytime that the tension is not on them, they act out. That is the basis of their personality disorder, getting attention. That's their histrionic. Okay. So guys, that's the difference between, oh, I didn't talk to you about the avoidant. Let's talk about avoidant. Patients with avoidant personality disorder, those are your cluster C type of, I'm doing a live. You want to say hi to them real quick? Okay. Those are um, the cluster C type of uh, personality disorders, and they do not like to be in social settings. They are very anxious. They are very nervous about being in social settings because they're afraid of doing something stupid. They're afraid of people laughing at them. So anyway, when it comes to histrionic, that's those are the ones mostly concerned um, about um, getting the attention on them and creating drama. Your patient with chronic renal failure is scheduled to begin dialysis. You assess which to be an atypical reaction. Would it be euphoria, labile react emotions, withdrawal, or depression? That's right. Euphoria. Whenever you see that word atypical in nursing in medicine, when you see a before a word, that means to be without. So atypical, that would be without typical, not being typical. So if a patient who's had chronic renal failure, oh, I spelled failure wrong. Sorry. They have chronic renal failure. They're about to start dialysis. What reaction is not typical? And it's euphoria. Euphoria is this extensive sense of happiness and joy, this high, they're not going to be happy about going on dialysis. You may see labile emotions where, you know, they're okay one minute, then they start crying, then they're okay again, then they start crying. You might see withdrawal from them where they don't want to talk about it. They withdraw from their friends and their loved ones, things that they used to enjoy, they withdraw from that. You may see depression where the patient has that sadness or even hostility turned towards self, but an atypical reaction, something you normally is, you're not going to see in the patient who's about to start dialysis is euphoria. They're not going to be happy about it. You're caring for a patient whose diagnosis falls under the cluster A category. Which behavior would you be assessing for? We're talking about cluster A. Is it suspicious and eccentric behavior? manipulative and dramatic behavior, anxious and fearful behavior, or Professor D, I have no clue. Very good suspicious or eccentric behavior. So, you know, a perfect example of the type of patient that you get in cluster A would be like your schizophrenic patient or your schizotypal patient, right? And then you have your cluster B. Cluster B would be your dramatic patients, so patients who like to manipulate. Those would be your patients such as your narcissistic patient, your, you know, your borderline uh, type of patients, borderline personality. 
And then cluster C are your patients who are fearful, they're anxious. Those will be your OCD type of patients, your avoided personality type disorders. Okay, so that's the difference between your type, your cluster A, cluster B, and cluster C. Your patient keeps having flashbacks of a distressing event you know that flashbacks are consistent with paranoia, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, or post-traumatic stress disorder. When you see that term flashbacks, uh, flashback, what should you be thinking of? Okay, very good. All of you guys got it correct. PTSD, and only half of you guys answered. There's 100 people in this room. But yes, when you see that word flashback, you need to be thinking of PTSD. Someone from the live just asked me to please repeat the clusters. So I'll repeat it again. So the cluster A, those are the type of patients who tend, you know, they have, you know, the odd, the eccentric, the bizarre, the paranoid type of personalities. And so examples of that would be your patients who are like schizotypal or schizophrenic, right? And then cluster B are more your type of patients who are manipulative, right? Those would be more like your antisocial personality disorders, your narcissistic personality disorders, your borderline personality disorders. And then cluster C are your patients who are more fearful. They're more anxious. That would be patients such as your, um, what type of patients cluster C? Uh, your avoidant personality disorder or your obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So those are the difference in the clusters A, B, and C. Someone just asked, what's the PIN? The PIN is 366-2790, 366-2790. Your patient with severe psoriasis is having chronic low self-esteem. Which strategy would you use working with your patient? Are you gonna approach them in a formal manner? Are you gonna keep the communication brief to reduce their level of embarrassment? Are you going to pretend not to notice affected areas so they are not ashamed? Or are you going to listen attentively? What strategy are you going to use for the patient that's experiencing chronic low self-esteem due to their psoriasis? Very good. Listen attentively. This is all about therapeutic communication. And sometimes therapeutic communication is just you sitting there offering self. When you just sit there, that means you're offering self. You're letting the patient know that they're so important that even though your time is important, you want to spend your time with them. And so you just sit there and you don't say anything until they're ready to talk. You listen attentively. Your depressed patient walks into the room and you note that her hair is combed and her clothes are neat. What would you say? Should you say, wow, you look great. Should you say, you must be feeling better today? Should you say, this is a first time event? Or should you say, I noticed that you're dressed and your hair is combed? What should be your reaction? Very good, most of you guys got, got the correct answer. This is called observation. All you do is make an observation. You state a fact. I notice that you're dressed and your hair is combed and you don't say anything else. You simply making that observe, the factual statement, right? You simply making that factual statement then you shut your mouth. You know, you give the patient a chance to think about it and say, yeah, you know, I started feeling a little bit better of my, about myself, so I decided to comb my hair. And then you guys can continue the dialogue. Let me explain to you why these other choices are wrong. Look at the first one. Eight of you guys chose, wow, you look great. You want to know what you just said to the patient? You just that, let that patient know that for the whole time that they were here up until today, they were looking a hot mess because this is the first time that you're telling them that they look great. So from today moving forward, 
You don't ever say to that patient, wow, you look great. You're confirming that thought in their head that they look a hot mess. That's number one. Number two, when it comes to therapeutic communication, we do not say anything that implies judgment or giving our opinion. You don't do that in nursing. Look at um, the second one. You must be feeling better today. We don't want to assume that we know what's going on with the patient because what if they're not feeling better, but the fact that you said it and they want to please you, they'll say, uh-huh, absolutely not. So we don't assume. The third one, this is a first time event. That's kind of passive aggressive. And you never want to put the patient in, you never want to make them feel like they have to kind of defend themselves. They already feel bad enough. They are depressed. So just make a simple factual statement and then don't say anything at all and allow them a chance to respond. You're performing an admission assessment on a pediatric patient and you suspect abuse. Which nursing action should you take? Should it be file charges against the parents? Report the case to legal authorities? Ask the mother to identify anyone that she thinks may be a suspect or ask the child if his or her, her parents hurt her. Okay, 40 people chose the correct answer, report to legal authorities, 17 people chose to ask the child. So let's talk about this. When it comes to abuse, if it's an adult, you're going to ask them directly. Well, let me back up. Let me back up. When it comes to abuse, if it's an adult, the first thing you're going to do is get that adult away from the person you suspect is abusing the patient. So if the patient comes in with a spouse or a boyfriend or uncle or whoever, this is an adult we're talking about, and you suspect that patient's being abused, you need to get them by themselves. So abuse is like one of the few times I can even think of in nursing, you're encouraged to lie through your teeth. You tell the patient in front of the person they're with, oh, we have to do go do this diagnostic test and they don't let anyone around. You, um, you have to come with me and make sure she leaves her phone because what happens is a lot of abusers will make the patient have the phone on speaker so they can hear everything being said. So you lie. You say whatever you have to say to get her alone, him or her alone, and then you ask them directly. Are you being abused? Are you being hurt? Are you being injured? Right. But when it's a child, you do not say to that child, are your parents hurting you? They're going to want to defend their parents no matter what. This is a child that we're dealing with. So when you suspect abuse, and usually when it comes to test questions, I know this says report to legal authorities, but there was no option of report this to the, your nursing supervisor or manager. If that was an option, that's what you, who you would report it to. And then the nursing supervisor or manager would contact the authorities, right? But that wasn't an option. So you're going to contact the legal authorities. You are a mandated reporter. Any questions about that on the live? Okay, good. So if it's an adult, you're going to ask them directly. But if it's a child and you suspect abuse, you're not going to go ask the parents. You're not going to even let the parents know of your suspicions because they might be the ones abusing the child. You're going to go to your nursing manager. And if that's not an option, you're going to contact the authorities yourself. Last question. Select all that applies. You're preparing to implement suicide precautions for suicidal patients, for a suicidal patient, excuse me. Which actions would you include? Select all that apply. So we're going to treat this as true, true or false. Okay. Suicide precautions. What are you going to do? Maintain arm's length distance with the patient at all times. Ensure that the meal trays contain no glass or metal silverware. Carefully watch the patient swallow each dose of medication. Conduct one-on-one -on -one observation 24 hours daily. Document the patient's mood, verbatim statements, and behaviors every 15 to 30 minutes per facility protocol. Allow the patient privacy when they're using the restroom. Select all that applies. What are you going to do for your patient that you're placing on suicide watch?
Okay. Let's talk about this. I saw um, on the live, lots of you guys said everything except for maintain arm's length distance with the patient at all times. Let me tell you something. Your patient that may possibly be suicidal, they may want to harm themselves. But guess what? They may want to harm others too. They may want to take others down with them. So you better maintain an arm's length. I'm not saying stand all the way across the hall from your patient, but make sure you are are at arm's length. So should they do decide that they want to harm you, you bought yourself a couple seconds to get away from that patient. You better maintain arm's length at all times. Not only should you maintain arm's length at all times, when it comes to patients who are suicidal, that want to harm themselves, they want to harm someone else, um, they're exhibiting features of violence, right? Let me tell you something. When it comes to psych patients, you need to always know where your exits are. Make sure you never have your back to your patient. You have to be aware of your surroundings. Absolutely, you better have that patient at arm's length. Next, ensure that the meal trays contain no glass or metal silverware so they can't use that to harm themselves. Absolutely. You better carefully watch them taking all of their medication because what you don't want them to do is hide the medication in their cheeks. That's called pocketing or cheeking, right? And then they'll collect the medication. Then when they have five, six, seven days worth or whatever it is that they can overdose, they'll take it all at one time. So you got to watch them swallow and then have them open their mouth, look in their cheeks, make sure that they're not pocketing that medication. You're going to have one-on-one -on -one observation on that patient. 24 hours a day. They are on suicide watch. You're going to be watching them at all times, including when they go to the bathroom, they go to the bathroom. They're going to go to the bathroom with the door open. Why? We need to make sure that they're not in there trying to hang themselves. When they go to sleep, you're not going to allow them to take the blanket and completely cover themselves at night when they go to sleep. You don't know what they're doing under that blanket. You have to be able to watch them to make sure that they don't harm themselves. And of course, you're going to document, document their mood, what they say, verbatim so you're going to have quotation marks verbatim and their behaviors every you know 15 to 30 minutes whatever per facility protocol okay guys thank you so much for watching this video please in the comment section let me know what you thought about this video i know there are so many more psychiatric concepts that i need to cover so i promise there are more coming this is just part one of a multi-part series but if there's anything specifically you want to see me cover please let me know in the comment section and also let me know how you would like me to present that information would you like it in a kahoot would you like it in a lecture would you like it in a q a format so go ahead uh sound off in the comments section. Don't forget to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. If you're interested in booking an NCLEX review or a consultation or a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session, or maybe you're still in the nursing program and you're struggling and you have to do really, really well on your next exam to pass, right? Well, I have lots of audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Be sure to check that out. And almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.